Hey guys, welcome back to One Stop Biology. So today we are going to again, you know, uh, study a very important topic of genetics. We are right now at the chapter Molecular Basis of Inheritance, and this topic is replication. So basically, in this video, we are going to study replication, the experimental proof of replication. and what is the exact machinery and what are the enzymes which are involved in replication right so guys before i start off with the topic i would request you to please like the video if you do understand the topic and please do not forget to mention your feedback in the comment section your feedback is very important i and i will be waiting for it whether you understood the topic or not please do let me know uh in the comment section below right so let's start off with replication now what happened is that in the previous video we studied about the watson and crick model of dna right so watson and crick were two scientists and they both gave the dna structure and what they said that the dna is a double helical structure right so basically what they said is that uh, you know while uh, while they were explaining the dna structure what they said that is that uh, the scheme basically there is a scheme for replication of dna as well so they proposed a scheme for replication of dna which they found out while they were experimenting on the dna so to quote you know their statement their original statement as it is given in ncert what they said is that it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material so they said this in 1953 i'll repeat it again that the specific pairing we have postulated the pairing between the nitrogenous bases right so the purines and pyrimidines the so specific pairing that we have postulated suggests immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material so this scheme basically suggested that these two strands the two anti parallel strands of dna would separate at some point and both of these strands would act as a template and this template would synthesis new complementary strands right so after the completion of replication of this dna what would happen is each dna would you know molecule would have one parental and one newly synthesized strand and this scheme was termed as semi conservative this scheme was termed as semi conservative dna replication right so basically if you see the uh, diagram here this is the model which was given by watson and crick for semi conservative dna replication so if you see here what you can see is that this is the parental dna so these this is one strand let me change the color if i can because ha huh. so basically this arrow which i am showing this is one strand which is going here this is the other strand so this is the other strand now after a point when replication is starting these two strands are basically separating and both the strands are acting as a template and here you have new strand which is forming again here you have a new strand forming and that is how here you have two different basically here you have two different set of dnas now wherein one is parental strand here also one is parental strand and the other one is newly synthesized strand so basically these parental strands have replicated themselves right now what was the experimental proof given against it let's see that so let's see the experimental proof so now basically it was proven by uh, you know watson and crick that dna replicates semi conservatively 
one strand is parental the other other strand is synthesized with that is semi conservative right now this was first shown in e coli remember that the proof was given for the first time in e coli and then subsequently in higher organisms of in of plants and even uh, animals including humans as well so in 1958 so now you remember the timeline that in 1953 watson and crick gave the replication uh, hypothesis they gave the replication scheme now in 1958 basically if you uh, want to know the experiment's name it is meselson and stoll experiment and it was basically given by two scientists matthew meselson matthew meselson and franklin stoll and that is how it is known as meselson and stoll's experiment so in 1958 they performed an experiment using e coli proving that dna replicates semi conservatively right so what they did now what they did is they grew e coli in a medium so what we can do is we can basically you know study this with the help of the diagram itself right so this is the diagram let me just you know uh, yes i hope it is completely visible to you guys let me just clear the screen as well once yeah so what they said is what they did is they grew e coli in a medium containing nh4cl right in a medium containing ammonium chloride right now basically here there was n15 so basically this ammonium chloride the nitrogen was 15 this is basically n15 is the heavy isotope of nitrogen right so basically they they uh, uh, grew e coli in a medium containing ammonium chloride with nit only nit basically as the only nitrogen source for many generations so what they gave is the heavy isotope of nitrogen was the only source for many generations of e coli now the result that they got was that this you know n15 was incorporated into newly synthesized dna right so this was incorporated in the newly synthesized dna right now this heavy dna because this was the heavy isotope of nitrogen we'll call it as heavy dna so this heavy dna molecule could be easily distinguished from the normal dna by centrifugation in the cesium chloride density gradient so what happens is if you centrifuge this basically the entire dna molecule the heavy dna molecule can be easily distinguished right now remember again that n15 the heavy nitrogen heavy isotope of nitrogen is not a radioactive isotope right and it can be separated based on densities it is not an not a radioactive isotope it's just a heavy isotope of nitrogen right after that what they did is they transferred the cells into a medium with normal ammonium chloride so after this they moved it to the normal nitrogen right ammonium chloride so with the here you had heavy isotope here you have normal isotope of nitrogen now right and they took samples at various definitive time intervals they took samples at different time intervals so when the cells multiplied right they when the cells multiplied they took various samples at different time intervals and then they extracted the dna right so they extra extracted the dna that remained as double stranded helix they extracted this dnas now again with the help of cesium chloride the various samples were separated depending on the densities right so basically now what they did is that the dna that was extracted from the culture one generation right with the nine basically from the transfer from nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14 medium 
right had a hybrid had a hybrid or intermediate density right and dna extracted from the culture after another generation right that had equal amount of this hybrid dna of or of and of basically light dna right so if you see the diagram here as well this dna that you see is the heavy dna this is the heavy dna right and you they gave a gravitational force right this basically is a sample of heavy dna right so this is heavy now after 20 minutes what they did is they got generation 1 in generation 1 they had light the normal dna as well as heavy dna Right, so here the DNA that they got was normal and heavy both. Now in the second generation, so basically after 40 minutes in generation 2. Now you can, you know, kind of think it as the, uh, uh, the Mendel's experiment that we used to do, right? The first generation, the second generation. So now they got the mixed DNA in the first generation. Then after 40 minutes, now what happened is they got four different kind of DNA. This was completely light. This had heavy as well as light. And again, there was one light. Right? So basically here they got a hybrid and a light one the hybrid was this and light was this right so here now you see what is happening is basically first this basically this segregated and one strand was the parental strand was heavy and the other strand formed was light. Again, the parental strand was heavy because it was treated in heavy nitrogen. The other strand was light, right? Now, again, after some time, what happened is, if you see here, there is one strand which is heavy, which goes here, and the other strand is light, the parental strand, which goes here. Again, here, you have one strand as heavy, which goes here, the light parental strand goes here. And the other DNA strands formed are all light because again they are not treated right so you see that one of the strand in all the generation is getting one of the parental strand basically is getting transferred is getting these are segregating these are separating and one of you'll see in the two daughter strands one strand is parental and the other strand is newly formed strand right so with this they confirmed that dna is semi conservative with this experiment they confirmed that dna is semi conservative now the, after that after this experiment when this was proven there were several other experiments which again you know which basically confirmed the theory that dna replicates and it is semi conservative right now let's see what is the exact machinery and what are the enzymes which are involved in replication right so in living cells such as say e coli the process of replication requires a set of catalysts so it is not a you know self motivated process this entire process requires catalysts or what we call it as enzymes it is known as enzymes, right? Now, the main enzyme is referred to as DNA dependent DNA polymerase. The main enzyme is known as DNA polymerase. The main enzyme is DNA polymerase, right? 
this basically this uses a dna template to catalyze the polymerization of deoxynucleotides the deoxynucleotides are polymerized by the dna template using this enzyme so this is the main enzyme remember the name dna polymerases right now the these enzymes basically are highly efficient enzymes and why they are known as highly efficient enzymes because they have to catalyze polymerization of a large number of nucleotides in a very short time right so for example say e coli that has 4.6 into 10 to the power 9 base pairs if we compare it to humans which has a diploid content of 6.6 into 10 to the power 9 base pair they complete the process of replication within 18 minutes guys remember that the process of replication is completed within 18 minutes so the average rate of polymerization is 2000 base pairs per second so do you remember that in your body 2000 base pairs are being replicated every second per second so you can you know you know, kind of get the pace at which polymerization happens right so these enzymes are highly efficient right and now not not the, these polymerases these dna polymerases they just not have to be fast but they have to be highly accurate as well right so they are basically fast as well as highly accurate now why they have to be highly accurate because any small mistake during replication would result into mutation and these mutation would cause genetic disorders right so any small mistake in replication would result into a disorder right now energetically if we talk about how much energy replication consumes it is a very expensive process guys it is a very expensive process right so what happens is there are deoxynucleotide nucleoside triphosphates right there are basically deoxynucleoside triphosphates which serve dual purpose right so basically in addition to acting as substrates they act as substrates they also provide energy for polymerization what provides energy for polymerization deoxy ribo nucleoside triphosphate they serve as substrate as well as provide energy right so they serve as substrate as well as they provide energy for polymerization reaction right so basically the two terminal phosphates of the chain the two terminal phosphates in a new deoxynucleoside triphosphates are high energy phosphates same as in case of atp as well right now in addition to this dna dependent dna polymerase in addition to this enzyme there are many additional enzymes which are required to complete the process of replication with high accuracy so for long dna molecules since the two strands cannot be separated in its entire length so say the dna molecule can be very long right so say if i draw a dna say this is one strand this is the other strand now it's not necessary that both the strands separate something like this what ha- what may happen is that they will so this is the closed dna they will maybe separate in between and then again maybe this 
this particular area will separate and replicate and this mechanism will keep on moving basically right so what happens in long dna molecule since the two strands cannot be separated in its entire length because of you know very high energy is required in that replication occurs within small opening of dna helix right so the, so some portion of the entire dna helix will open it will replicate and then this mechanism will move forward right now this is referred to a replication fork so basically they make a replication fork now we'll see what happens in replication fork basically now what happens is the dna dependent dna polymerase catalyze the polymerization only in one direction so it is always from 5 to 3 direction remember it is always from 5 to 3 direction now this also creates some additional complications at the replication fork so what is happening now that on one strand the template with polarity 3 to 5 is there the replication is continuous you will understand this with the help of the diagram itself this is a replication fork right now say this strand is 5 to 3 and this is 3 to 5 because both these strands run anti-parallel right so now replication happens from 5 to 3 right now the basically the polymerase catalyzes polymerization only in one direction that is 5 to 3 now in the 5 to 3 wala strand in this strand basically the replication will be continuous because here you basically you have 5 this side 3 this side right so this is continuous while on the other with the polarity of 5 is to 5 to 3 now here you have the polarity of 3 to 5 right so here it is continuous there is another strand where the polarity is 5 to 3 now here what happens is the replication is discontinuous right now these so basically fragmented it is fragmented there are multiple fragments formed now these fragments are later joined by dna ligase this is another enzyme now dna ligase joins these discontinuous synthesized fragments so this is another enzyme apart from DNA polymerase, right? Now the DNA polymerase on their own cannot initiate the process of replication. Another challenge that the DNA polymerases on their own cannot initiate the process of replication. And replication does not initiate randomly at any place. There is a definite region in E. coli where the replication originates. These regions are known as ORI or origin of replication. These are known as origin of replication. Now, this is because of the requirement of origin of replication that a piece of DNA, if needed to be propagated during recomb recombinant DNA procedures, requires a vector. Now, this vector provides the origin of replication. So, say if you have to replicate a segment of DNA which does not have, a, you know, ORI, the origin of replication, you will need a vector. This vector will have the origin of replication and because of, you will combine this vector to the DNA that you want to replicate. And now, because of this vector, the replication will start. Right? Now, in the case of eukaryotes, the replication of DNA takes place in S phase of the cell cycle. So, you have multiple phases of cell cycle, right? So the replication of DNA takes place at S phase. At S phase. Right? Now, the replication of DNA and cell division cycle should be highly coordinated, guys. These are highly coordinated DNA replication and the cell cycle 
cell division cycle because a failure in cell division after dna replication results into a chromosomal anomaly which is polyploidy right so basically here the template you are saying that the diagram that you're saying you have template strand so you have template dna which is basically the parental strand right these are the parental strand now this is the discontinuous synthesis and towards the other side you have continuous synthesis these two are the newly synthesized strands right so basically this is the overall mechanism of replication which is given in the ncrt as per the syllabus of ncrt where you have two important enzymes involved one is dna polymerase and the other is dna ligase so guys with this we have finished the topic of replication as per ncrt syllabus in the next topic we are going to study all about transcription right so i hope you understood the you know uh, technicality of uh, replicate dna replication i hope you understood the topic completely if not please do let me know in the comment section or you can message me on whatsapp and the whatsapp number is given in the description of this video but guys i'll again request you that your feedback is very important to me so please do not forget to let me know whether you like the video or not or if you need any additional information and please do not forget to like the video share it with your friends and if you are new to the channel please do not forget to subscribe to the channel thanks guys bye bye